So, um, who am I? I'm Armin Rigo. You probably already saw me yesterday for the CFFI Lightning Talk. I'm a core contributor of PyPy. And what is PyPy? PyPy is an alternative implementation of Python. So that means basically another Python interpreter. I mean, whose aim is to be very compatible with the standard Python, which we call C Python. But, but it has a, a, a main focus on speed. So it, 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 includes, it includes a lot of crazy things that I'm not going to talk about, like a just-in-time just compiler, et cetera, et cetera, a good garbage collector, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the speed results are generally there. I mean, this is a sl uh, kind of a wrong graph because it does not include all benchmarks that we have. We also have benchmarks that are slower than CPython, but these, these are only a subset of benchmarks that happen to be faster. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I mean, it's, it's between zero, well, between two thirds of the speeds, and then, well, can get up to 30 times faster and you can build more artificial example where it's up to 900 times faster or something like that. And ju just, just to make a point, so it's, it's like Python, except that you start with, with PyPy. You get a nice prompt that has a line containing a funny quote from the RSC channel, a random funny quote. And you get, the main difference is that you have four instead of three <laughs> signs here. <laughs> I mean, apart from that, it's really just a Python interpreter, right? <laughs> As you can see in this very complicated example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's talk about SQL by example, of course. So. In SQL, if you want to do an, I don't know, you want to read some, some information from a database table and up, uh, do an update based on what you just read, and you want it all done nicely in one transaction, you write code like this. Okay? Now, here is another example of Python. Here I want to read the value out of an object, and an object attribute and compute the, the attribute plus one and store it back into the same or whatever, store it somewhere, okay? So what's the difference between this and this? The difference is that, well, this code here is not atomic. As in, if I run this code in multiple threads, then I have the risk that if both threads are reading from the same object, then, well, as written now, with the dot, 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 <coughs> as written now, it might be the case that both threads will read the old value increment and store the value plus one, which means that uh, after both threads have run, you have only incremented the value once. I mean, kind of very obvious, right? Okay, so, so well, what we can do in Python is something like that, which is actually written like this usually. You, you acquire a lock and release a lock, and then, well, if you are, if you are not an old-time old Python guy like I am, then you would probably write it like this instead. So that's still the same. Okay. Now I'm introducing, I mean, this is the difference, right? Instead of saying with the lock where it's a particular lock that I'm using around this particular object, I'm using with atomic, which is basically a single lock, if you want. It means I want to run this code atomically. But it's the same, right? It's the same as I want to acquire and release a lock around it. Well. So it's not completely the same. There is a difference, obviously, between locks as presented here and transactions are, as they exist in databases. The difference is that this, 
if you have multiple threads that both that each of the, where each of them do transactions like this, what will what what will occur in a real database? Obviously, a real database has logic inside to allow both of these transactions to proceed, and then the commit may actually fail at the end if there is conflict. But if there is no conflict, then then both commits succeed. The, that's the difference between transaction and locks is that, well, with locks, if you run this code in two threads, the, then only one, one thread can actually do what is inside the with block. The other thread will just wait. So what, well, the, the whole point of this talk is just to say, oh, look, we can actually have an implementation of Python, which allows you to write it to, to write locks quote quote as in with atomic, and allows these to run actually in parallel. How? Using the same the same thing as database transactions, and this, this is actually something that that well, it's something that exists as in, as in it's. It's, it's, uh, it exists since the 90s, I think, but it was, it was started, I mean, serious academic research was started on it in the year 2000 and something. Uh, and now you, you can see actually quite a lot of papers about transactional memory, software transaction memory, hardware transaction memory, etc. cetera. So there are various subdivisions then, etc. cetera. So the, go the goal is to the goal is to enable this simply. It's called transactional memory because what is transactional in this case, you are running each of these two threads, are run, I mean each of these two threads are each running one transaction from the point of view of the shared memory instead of from the point of view of some external database. So, so how, how, how is it actually implemented? Well, that's hard. That's hard, but, uh, but that's not magic. It's my point. <laughs> it's like a database, really. A modern database, I'm sure that, that almost nobody here has any clue how a, a database really works, right? I mean, y y you know how to use it, I'm sure, but you have no clue how, how the details are done, how, how, how is it actually done to, to run multiple 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 transactions in parallel and, and not, well, you know the usual issues, but basically uh, even, well, one, one select must not return a value that another commit already committed if the select is, an, is inside an older transaction it must instead return the old value, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it's hard. So yes, now, uh, by the way, by the way, we, 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 have, we had here several talks already, like uh, Matt previously, who talked about, well, I have the GIL, the global interpreter lock in Python, and it's annoying me, and here I'm doing these complicated walk-arounds. Walk and, and yes, well, these walk-arounds actually have a point, because, well, if you, if you have a multi-core machine, the, then, well, what I mean is the, the global interpreter lock is not the final blocker, right? Because, because if, if you have an eight-core machine, for example, then removing the global interpreter lock would actually allow you to multiply the, the speed of a multi-threaded program by eight, but not more, obviously. If you want to go further, then you, then you really need uh, pff, you, to use several machines, and then so, so you use TCP connections using memcached or something, obviously. It's not the final answer, but the point is that it is still a problem. So, so by the way, this, Techniques that I'm describing is actually able to remove the global interpreter lock, simply. So, how? Why? Because, because actually, what is the global interpreter lock? It is a lock that exists around every single subexpression, every every part of your program, 
I want to say every statement, but actually it's more fine-grained than that. So every part of the program runs in a lock. So it's, it's as if you had written your Python program and you have, you have put every word with lock, with lock, with lock. Always the same lock. So, so if you look at it like this, then yes, this technique actually, this technique is very good because you can replace with lock with, with atomic. So, so yes, actually any existing multi-threaded program runs on multiple cores. Yes, we solved the problem of the grill. That's great. So, no, sorry. <laughs> we, we did it on top of PyPy. So that's, uh, that's the first restriction, basically. You need to have a program that, that has been, well, that, that, that has been proved to work on PyPy first. And when I say it's very compatible, yes, it's compatible, but, but well, yes, it is very compatible, but not 100 total person. Basically, uh, and any big project is going to run into issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, too bad for now. What I'm describing <laughs> works only on PyPy. So, so uh, as a side note, it would not actually be completely impossible to 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 implement it on top of C Python too. But it would well, it would be almost completely impossible. Basically, you you need to to pff, you you need to change every line basically. <laughs> or, or something close like that. I mean, I'm saying it's not completely impossible because it might be the case that someday in the next few years somebody crazy is, somebody crazy is really thinking that it's worth it and then he just goes, goes around, goes in a corner for two years and hop, we have it. <laughs> yes. Okay, but, but this is only half of the story, in my opinion, removing the deal. Because, because the other half is we have actually support for with Atomic, where you can actually use it to make larger sections of your code Atomic instead of just one statement at a time. So here is an example. I mean, a kind of kind of obvious example, you have a list of, uh, of all your accounts in your bank system and you want to, for, for, for each account, call apply interest, which is multiply the balance in the account by 1.05, so add 5%. Okay, so this is a trivial example where it can be parallelized in theory. So how do we parallelize it? We want to run this loop multi-threaded. So, so we can actually have a, um, a thread pool system where, where we run n threads and then here we schedule all function calls, all, all of these different methods, we schedule them into the thread pool and then we say run all tasks which will basically run until all, th all tasks are done and every thread runs the function apply interest and the point is that actually I mean this is a difference with a normal standard thread pool system is that the, the, the actual threads run in a with atomic statement which means that well whatever they are doing they are doing it atomically so it means another way to say it is that it looks from your point of view, from, from the point of view of the programmer, it looks as if all the calls to apply interest occurred in some order, some sequential order. I mean, it, it was actually run in parallel multi using multiple calls. However, you don't need to think about multiple calls at all, at all in this model. So he, here is a summary manage the pool of thread, each thread runs a task in with atomic, it uses threads internally so you never see that there is any thread and it's, it, it's simple, I mean the, the basic idea of running a thread pool is simple and you can implement it on pure Python. 
So here's another example. This example is about computing train tables. And yes, I'm from Switzerland, so I need one such example. <laughs> so, so, so. It's, it's doing something like for every train, we compute, compute the time at which one train can start based on the, over the other trains that have dependencies like, like correspondence or, or times, times where they cannot share the same track or something like that. And in this example, you would run a number of iteration of this complete loop. So one way to parallelize it would be simply you, you run it, well, you, you, just, you just schedule tasks that are each, each computing the new starting time of one train. So we, this is similar to the previous example, but it shows a bit more the, the additional complexities is because here what I, what I left out in the dots are things like I'm going to read the, de the, the other train's dependencies and at what time they start. So, so I'm going to, I mean, in order to update the starting time of one train, I need to, I need to read the starting time of other trains and so on and so forth. So there is some kind of, some ki there is some kind of dependency. I mean, if you think about this problem in terms of an SQL database, you are going to have conflicts. I mean, hopefully not many, but you are going to have conflict. So how, how are you actually getting conflict in a normal Python program then? This is, well, it's very similar to database, basically. It's the same problem and, well, you have the same solution. You, you have, you have, well, here, here it's, with objects instead of records. So if, some, if two different threads happen to run in parallel two atomic blocks and they both happen to write, for example, to the same val value, then, then, then they cannot both commit. What will occur actually in this case is that one of the thread commit and the other, the other aborts. But well, what, what we have, well, in the, in the current implementation, it's all transparent, as in if one thread decides to abort, then it actually restarts transparently from where, from the start of its own transaction. And uh, actually there is another issue, an issue, an issue that is not present in database. It's what, well, you cannot run a bit of code that would print stuff out and then decide to abort the transaction. Because, because the, uh, what you printed is already sent to the terminal. You cannot take this back. So any, any input or output means that the transaction in which it occurred needs to be made inevitable, which means unavoidable. <laughs> so so, so it, it means that as long as you don't, don't don't do too much input output, then, then it's all nicely parallelizable. But but as soon as as soon as you as all threads, for example, would I mean a typical example is if all threads would write to uh, to a log file, the same log file, then then they will conflict. They will not conflict with each other, but they will they will be turned inevitable. Okay, uh, the current status, what, what we have actually now is that the, basic, the basics work. So, so the, there is a PyPy STM. I cannot show it here, sadly, because it's, it's translated on a remote machine. Um, the the JIT compiler, compiler integration is almost done. It, has, it is actually finished as of this morning. <laughs> so, 
So you get, you get the different executable that is called PyPy dash STM instead of PyPy, but otherwise it works the same. It tends to print debugging output. Uh, well, the, 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 the small detail that I passed under the carpet so far is that it's actually about three times slower than a normal PyPy, at least three times, in bad cases up to 10 times. Okay, well, what it means, what it mean, this is the, the slowdown on one core, right? So if you have a program that is able to use all your eight cores, then it will actually be uh, 2.6 times faster in total, as in real time. It, it's, it, it sounds like a complete waste, of course, to, 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 to use eight cores instead of one just to get two times faster, but, but well, that's what you get so far. <laughs> uh, yes, and so far it's only Linux 64-bit. That, that's the kind of traceback you get, you get when you use this, this PyPy STM. This is not a real traceback because this is just a warning that it gets printed to, to standard error by now, by default. So this, this is a warning that the transaction was aborted and you have lost 47 milliseconds, as in the, the transaction has, has done already 47 milliseconds, but, 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 well, too bad, we need to abort it, so. So you get, you actually get the trace back, and in this case, for example, we see that the abortion occurred on this line here, so we can guess that uh, the problem is, is this scene here, which is a, a dictionary recording stuff, so the problem would be, for example, that somebody else, another thread, has modified the same dictionary. I'm not implemented yet, but similar is about inevitable, where you would see this kind of, of tracebacks, where, well, here it's, it's telling us that this transaction did an I.O. call like here, printing to a log, uh, to a log file, and this, and because of this I/O call, it blocked other transactions. So, more precisely, what occurs is that this, I mean, printing to log files or so on, is fine if you put it at the end or near the end of the transaction. But if you put it near the beginning of the transaction then the whole rest of the transaction will, will run inevitably. So it means that if you put it near the start of the transaction, as soon as it's really done, it is this transaction here that must commit next and not any other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a uh, little bit of talking about future work because well, what, what we did so far is really only work on the core PyPy STM. Uh, f future work, future interesting work is tweaking a rect reactor from Twisted, for example. I mean, I I it's similar with Tornado, Eventlib, etc. actually. But if, if I take the, the example of Twisted, you have, uh, in the typical application, you have some twisted reactor that, that is going to use select your uh, poll or epoll or something, and it's going to invoke callbacks that have, are defined by the user, deferred, basically. So how, how can you, I mean, I in this model, this is, this is completely, well, this is, especially for the case of twisted, this is completely a non-multi-threaded example. However, no, no, it, it can be made multi-threaded. How do you make it multi-threaded? You have, you have one reactor, well, like this, this is a completely simplified example. You have one reactor, so it calls epoll or something, gets a list of events, but then instead of sequentially going through the list and calling the callback for each event, instead you, well, you put them in some queue and you have several threads, several real threads that all get the next event from the queue. 
and call the call back, but in with atomic. It means that actually doing the callback is done completely atomically. So from the point of view of the user of Twisted, it's exactly as if, as if there were no threads. So you can, so it's possible basically to, to use a Twisted application, an existing Twisted application, and have it run on multiple threads with no change in the application. Well, more future work, more things we want to do. Well, we need to look at many more examples, and we need to tweak the data structures as in, well, wh what I mean is that, for example, now if you have big dictionaries that are shared, like, like a cache or something, th th then any thread that would store a different value in this dictionary is going to conflict with any other thread that is going to read the dictionary, even if they are not reading on the same key. That, that's stupid right now. So, so it needs a bit more careful implementation of a dictionary, basically. So this is an example of tweaking data structures on a, a, a fear that it's not, well, it's not going to be as simple as that, too, as in, as in there are some kind of data structures that are written completely in Python, for example, and that look like they, they, w they conflict when you, have a, when you have parallel threads that access them. But, but well, I mean, look, look like as in the internals of the data structure conflict, yes, but the external, I mean, the API of the data structure should not conflict. So, so well, this is ongoing work, basically, how, how to change. You, you probably, I mean, in the case I just described, you, 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 need to, you, need, you need to go inside the implementation and tweak it to, to rewrite it in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, more for t future work for, for us. We need to reduce the slowdown because, well, the slowdown of three times is already great because it's, it's a constant factor, basically, then you can say, well, just add more cores. But, but well, we still need to reduce this slowdown, and I, I, think, I think it's possible to get down to two times or something, I would guess. And we, well, porting to a different operating system, yes, obviously, uh, I mean, it's kind of easy, but has not been done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, small note, here I'm saying STM all over the place, where S stands for, for software. It means software transactional memory because, because there is, there is another, another technique that is called hardware transactional memory, which is well, a technique that gives you the same thing, but instead of being implemented purely in software, it's using support from the CPU. So there is actually nowadays, if you take the, later, the latest version of the Intel processor, the Haswell generation, it actually supports special instruction that gives you an HTM, so a hardware transactional memory system. But, but well, the, 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 the problem is that these models are, uh, <laughs> Well, basically, they are far too limited. They, they don't support anything a bit strange that you need to do. And so, uh, and additionally, they have limits about the size of the transaction, as in if the transaction is very small, it's fine. But if the transaction is too big, then it's, it's, it's going to, to overflow some internal buffer and then, well, then yes, then what occurs is that the transaction go into a board, and then what you need actually is anyway you need to have an STM version of the same code that you can run in case of the in case the HTM did not manage. Mm -hmm. So well, I mean basically it's future work to try to integrate HTM with STM and see how far that works. But well, for now I'm not too optimistic about it. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, I still have 
a couple of minutes to give you a very, very high level of overview of how it works, actually. So the, the basic idea is that every object that your program manipulates can have several versions. You can so re really have several copies of it in memory that are at different revisions each. I mean, that's, so far that's similar to a database, right? Because you need, you need to remember the old and the new version of some record that was modified just now. So, so how, it is how, it's, how it is implemented is, well, you, the ver every version is either private to a thread or shared to all threads. The shared version are immutable, so it means that, uh, well, so you have the shared immutable version and the private version that belongs to one thread and which this thread can write to. And the synchronization, well, you, ne you need some cross CPU synchronization, but only at the point where one thread needs to actually access an object that is so far private to, no to another thread. So when this occurs, then you need some bit of synchronization between these two, two threads and, the, uh, and then the threads can steal the other thread object, which means basically make a copy and make it shared. Um, well, yes, a bit of detail. This is, this is all done with a generational garbage collector, which means basically it's a garbage collector which use, well, which use a nursery. So the nursery is where the young objects are allocated. So every thread allocates objects in its own nursery. And so far, they are only private to this thread. And well, when the nursery is full, we copy the objects outside it. Or there is also stealing when another thread needs to steal one thread that actually when another thread needs to steal one object that belongs to, uh, an, to another thread's nursery, it needs to steal it and make a copy of it outside. Mm -hmm. So this is really the one, the 10,000 feet overview. I mean, the, the, the whole point of this is to give you the impression that it's all very simple. OK, so I, I have presented transactions in Python, big change under the cover, small change for Python users. And by the way, the global interpreter lock is gone. And I should mention this work was sponsored or is still sponsored by crowdfunding. Oh, crowdfunding. <laughs> Thanks to everybody in questions. So um, the GIL is uh, RIP. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, hopefully. Questions? I've got one over there, one over there. Okay, I've got lots of those. So what is the, the right sort of length for a transaction? It seems like the longer a transaction runs, the more risk you run of having a collision with somebody else. And my understanding is that if you have two STM threads that run at the same time and they collide, I guess one of them wins, but all the other threads that collide at the same time then get run serially. And so you mm. just like everything sort of slows down at that point. So you want to avoid those slowdowns, so it's best to have small transactions. But small transactions are hard to write because it's hard to do everything you want. So like, what is, is there any sort of guideline of how long transactions should be? Uh, yes, I, I don't know. The, the answer is no, basically. I, w I want, and I kind of manage to write the implementation of FairPy STM such that it's doing fine with transactions of any size. You, 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 of course, you re run the risk that if you have very long running transactions that are bought at the end, then, then it's lots of work that is lost. But, 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 well, I mean, there is no general guideline. It's really a matter of depending on your application. I mean, so the idea is really for it to be a small change for Python users. Yes, and, 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 and uh, the, 
yes, uh, last, uh, last note is that if you don't use with atomic, you are relying on, uh, you are still using transaction all over the place because the gil is replaced with transaction. And thus the length of these transaction is completely arbitrary, but usually small, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you were very apologetic about the three-time slowdown, but that's relatively quite normal time. <laughs> um, for someone who's seriously weighing this up, they're probably already on a Linux server, 64 bits, mm -hmm. and they're using C Python. Mm -hmm. In that context, given the you know, speed up you've already got with PyPy, if they're weighing this up um, just from the, the original graph, you're probably looking at a slight speed up, even on one core, if you're comparing you know, your project with the SK internet. Yes. And cores, it's just a straight win. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Well, ideally, down, yes. You know, ideally. Down, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, yes, but I, I should also add that anybody that is going to just try it out is probably going first to not have any speed up at all because of some obscure details that gives transaction conflicts. But then he can see them and start fixing. I mean, I mean, and this is an, an, another detail that I should mention. I like this approach a lot because it's, well, you start, you start writing your program and it gets conflicts and it doesn't get fast, but it's still correct, right? Your program works. And then, and then you, can fix, you can fix maybe 80% of the most common conflicts uh, and you have, far, you have a performance that is f good enough. As opposed to, like I'm, if I'm a C++ programmer that needs to write a multi-threaded program, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you get you get you get a different uh, the opposite effect. You get very fast performance, but what bugs? So even after you have solved eighty percent of the bugs, your program is still buggy. Well, I mean, so, 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 so the idea is to, to have this add task and run all tasks which actually use with in Atomic internally, but that's not a big upfront investment okay. because, because, well, you're just making things Atomic. And, and well, also, also I should mention that you can actually have an implementation of with, with Atomic that is Atomic equals some lock. Yes. Yes, you can you can do that. Mm -hmm. One more quick question. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about HDM as well. Have mm -hmm. you like is is Intel talking to you or are you talking to <laughs> Intel about yes. like you know improving the CPU to help you? Yes, I mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, the CPUs are a bit limited right now, so I don't know. Well, well we, we, uh, I think that we will always need uh, more, one of these more complicated implementation that is really using multiple objects and well, all database like basically. Thanks so much, Alvin. This is by far the coolest thing I've ever been quite on. I really enjoy that. Uh, modern dynamic languages have given us garbage collection, which mm -hmm. has been the biggest threat because you don't have to worry about memory anymore. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen today, I. Am I right in thinking that PyPy STM lets us stop worrying about concurrency on a single machine, which has been the other biggest? Mm, yes. Problem. I mean, I, I did. I, I, I think that deserves a round of applause. I did. I did a talk at PyCon uh, earlier this year where I was comparing GC and STM. Awesome. Exactly. One Quick question around the immutable persistent memory model, similar mm -hmm. to closure. Mm -hmm. uh, well, memory is cheap, but how does that affect the RAM usage, the memory? Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I did not do any measure in this direction. What, what I guess is that it does not have any big impact because actually most objects will have only one version anyway. 
I mean, if you, if you start with thinking about, I have one gigabyte of object, then there is no way that the transaction that runs for 0 0.1 second is going to touch all these objects. So if I have 64 cores, um, this yeah. program will still be 2.2.3x. Um, yes. No locking between 60 and 30. And pff, uh, hopefully not. I mean, at, at, at some point, the internal implementation of STM needs to be tweaked for large number of cores, but, but I don't know yet what large is for my particular implementation. Thank you very much. We did test up to 24. Yes, we tested up to 24 successfully. So 24 is still small? Yes. <laughs> uh, we've got maybe two more questions. Um, I've got kind of two, two for one, but quick. Um, the first one is to do with the netability. If I'm writing code using PyPy STM and say I want to do I.O. operations in the comic block, would it be then advisable to actually, instead of actually doing the I.O. operation in the block, rather push it out as a mm -hmm. kind of asynchronous event and then have something else running asynchronously actually doing I.O.? Yes, precisely. I mean, that, that's a typical solution for logging, for example. Okay. Uh, the other quick question is, is not quite relevant to the STM, but is there any kind of tail call optimization being added to PyPy? I asked Larry about this with regards to CPy, and he said Guido okay. is not going to go there ever. But he said I should ask you in case <laughs> you are actually going to be doing that at some point. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, last question over there. Good. Hi, thanks, Armin. Um, again, I'm just kind of sorry, I'm not a mystery voice. Um, it seems that an inevitable might have a, a sister in, in something like commutable. I don't know if there are plans for that, but an operation which could have its results stored as a delta rather than as a blocking transaction. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Are there plans for that? Or is, it, yep. so, is it possible? Probably. I mean, it's. I don't know, basically it depends on the case-by-case case basis. If I got your question right, for example, there is a case of dictionaries that so far you, you write anywhere it conflicts with a read of a di different key just because they are stored in the same array. So it's a matter of, well, using a, an approach that's more similar to concurrent dictionaries in Java or something like that. So, 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 so I think that for this kind of problem we need custom solutions. Mm -hmm. And probably custom solution really written in in the core of PyPy, as in you cannot write it as a Python library, or maybe you can. I don't. I don't know. It depends. Mm -hmm. Armin Rigo, thank you for making my code run faster. <laughs> Thank you for lunch, everybody.